to get the word out about tonight. Let me just share with you a little bit about our speaker for this evening. His name is Ravi Zacharias. I know some of you may not be familiar with him. Ravi Zacharias is founder and president of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. For the last 43 years, he has spoken all over the world, including at educational and cultural dynamos such as Harvard, Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins, and Cambridge. He has addressed writers of the Peace Accord in South Africa and military officers at the Lenin Military Academy and the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow. He has also authored or edited well over 20 books, such as Has Christianity Failed You? and won the Golden Medallion Award for his book, Can Man Live Without God? As we engage in the topic this evening, it is my hope that we'll all walk away from it challenged to be people who think deeply and critically. No matter what your faith background may or may not be, I also hope we can engage in these matters with maturity and utmost respect for one another and each other's beliefs. To that end, after the talk, we will hold a Q&A session that will be both face-to-face -face and digital. We have college students here, so we have to be digital. <laughs> During Ravi's talk, we encourage you to develop thought-provoking questions that are clear, concise, and relevant to the topic at hand. Please do those three things, clear, concise, and relevant to the topic at hand. For the face-to-face -face questions, simply write your questions on the provided index card. We have given you an index card as well as a pencil as you walked in so that you can begin to write those. You can write them during the talk. Whatever inspires you to ask those questions, bring them, and we'll give you all the logistics on how to come to this microphone after Ravi is done talking. For those who may prefer the digital route or those who are watching live online, we'd like for you to tweet, simply tweet your question, and at the end of it, make sure you hashtag RZIMPIT. It is our desire to give preference to people who are skeptics or those who may not be of the Christian faith background. To alert us to this fact, both on the cards or in your tweet, simply put the hashtag of your faith background. For example, hashtag skeptic or hashtag Hindu. And we want to give preference to those questions because we desire to be challenged as well as challenge one another. We'll do our very best to get through as many questions as possible, and it is my hope to ask one or two questions from Twitter because I think that that kind of atmosphere where we're both face-to-face -face and digital is kind of where we are in this world today. So without further ado, I give to you Ravi Zacharias. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Am I mic'd? Uh, is my microphone on? Can you hear me or not? Got me on now? No? You can? All right. Maybe you will even say yes if the answer is no, so that you can get a nice restful evening. So before I go into my subject matter, let me read for you this. It was read to me by my mother-in-law in Toronto last week. She is 96 years old. I have no idea why she read this to me and my wife and fam family there, but she was laughing all the way. Here it is. Steve, age 92, and Sally, age 89, living in Florida, are all excited to get married. They go for a stroll to discuss the wedding. And on the way, they pass a drugstore. Steve suggests that they go in. Steve addresses the man behind the counter. Are you the owner? The pharmacist answers, yes. Steve, we're about to get married. Do you sell medication? Pharmacist, of course we do. Steve, how about medicine circulation? Pharmacist, all kinds. Steve, medicine for rheumatism? Pharmacist, definitely. Steve, medicine for memory problems, arthritis, and Alzheimer's. Pharmacist, yes, a large variety, the works. Steve, what about vitamins, sleeping pills, antidotes for Parkinson's disease? Pharmacist, absolutely. Steve, everything for heartburn and indigestion? Pharmacist, we sure do. Steve, you sell wheelchairs and walkers and canes? Pharmacist, all speeds and all sizes. Steve, adult diapers? Pharmacist, sure. I help you. Steve said, we'd like to use this store as our bridal registry. (Laughter) 
I could just sit down and say, that's what it means to be human. <laughs> Everything you want to talk about is right there, all the fragility. This is fluctuating a bit, isn't it? Uh, oh my. Uh, if it continues to do so and you want to put me on a fixed microphone, I'll be okay with that so long as I don't have to hold on to it. I do speak with my hands and um, they put, but I think it seems to be going off and on. Is there anything I'm doing that's not right or is it, uh, are we okay back there, the sound booth? I think he's coming to give me a bit of a helping hand here. <clears throat> That's what happens when you go digital. <laughs> yeah. I'll just take this one off. better? Can you hear me yet? No. Testing, testing, testing. Tell me if you can hear me at the back too. I see some in the front who got their thumbs up, down. They're giving a thumbs down there. So I don't know what the, <laughs> that means. <laughs> I've had that happen before too. Okay. <laughs> How about now? Are we adjusting anything there? Not yet. Hello, hello, hello. Testing, testing. They're still complaining in the back rows there. No. Want me to keep going, trying this? Still a little better, we want it a little higher? Yeah, they're asking for it to be raised a little higher. How about now? A little better? All right, that's good. I appreciate that, thank you. could become a shocking experience. He's just left me with some, some, that's the way I fix things at home, all right. Well, this will be a bit of a challenge for me because it'll keep me flat-footed here, but I'll do my best because I think if I move away from that, you won't be able to hear me. But when I'm standing put here, are you okay now? Can you, yes, thank you so much. The whole subject of what it means to be human Actually, the first time I was ever asked to really address this was a few years ago at Johns Hopkins when they were doing this as a thematic uh, study and had invited several people of different perspectives to present their answers on how they saw the response to the question, what does it mean to be human? And there were two Christians called on to address the issue and Francis Collins and I were the ones who took the Judeo-Christian worldview to answer the question. But that was some years ago. And as I'm looking at the theme now, developing it in my own way for different audiences, this is really one of the most foundational questions in life for you and for me, because it is in effect a self-defining question in general terms 
that has particular and individual implications. Some of you may have um, heard me tell the story of what happened many, many years ago in the former Soviet Union in the year 2000 when they decided to empty their prisons and all of the political prisoners were being released. One of the men who was released had already been there for 55 years. He was about 20 when he had been incarcerated and he was 75 now. He was a Hungarian by descent and he had gotten into the war, had been captured and was now kept under Soviet control and for a lot of those years was in solitary confinement. They were actually going to execute him because they thought he had lost his mind and was speaking what they thought was total gibberish. But somebody suggested that they bring in a Hungarian psychiatrist to examine him if indeed he was what they said, that he was insane. And the psychiatrist came and spent several hours with him, if not days, because the first time I told this story, I was in Washington, D.C., and a man from the audience walked up from Hungary. He said, I know exactly who you're talking about. This story really hit the headlines back home. So Andrei Stamas was the prisoner, captured at the age of 20, and now being a pawn in discussion 55 years later. The psychiatrist said to the Soviet powers that be, release him to us, we will take care of him. He is not speaking gibberish, he's speaking an old Hungarian dialect. We will be happy to make him well, it'll take some time. And they finally signed the papers and the, med the medical practitioner put him on a wheelchair and was wheeling him out. As he was heading out, he asked and made his first request. Nobody was expecting what he was going to ask for. He asked for a mirror. He hadn't seen his face in 55 years. So age 20, when he was incarcerated, now 75, worn out, exhausted, bullied, almost dehumanized. When they gave him the mirror, he, the doctor said he looked at it for all of about a second or two, put it face down, and held his face in his hands and just sobbed uncontrollably. He had lost the image of who he was and how he even looked. If you have ever been to the concentration camps of Auschwitz or Buchenwald or Dachau or anywhere and you see the pictures of the people as they were brought in and then as some were executed and even the children and so on, you see that sunken face look of just bones with skin pulled taut around that skeletal structure. They hardly know who they are. It is a deliberate effort to get them to undefine themselves. And as I read that story some time back, some years ago, I asked myself the question, how did their tormentors define what it meant to be human. They must have had a definition. They must have had a way of viewing their fellow human beings. Whatever the definition was, it was obvious that they were taking them from a pretty low rung of a ladder to bring them lower and lower and lower till not only was the tormentor wrongly defining them, but the individuals had lost a definition for who they were and what they were intended to be. That's really what this story is all about. In fact, the entire Nazi attempt was to find the Superman, the superior human who could control the race and take the less capable and the less pos possible in them to be submerged and dominated by the superior. What does the Bible say about this? My talk to you tonight, my dear friend, is going to be on the Judeo-Christian view of what it means to be human. I will take the major address here, and after I finish, my colleague from Oxford University who uh, teaches at Wycliffe Hall at, at Oxford, Vince Vitale, a dear friend and a colleague, he and I had the privilege of authoring the last book together, what does it mean to be, uh, on why suffering? 
And now we are teaming up on this theme of what does it mean to be human? And we are about to team up on another book as well. Vince did his master's work at Princeton, did his doctoral work at Oxford University, and is one of our senior faculty now at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics there. And he will take about nine or 10 minutes after I'm finished to try and pull some of his thoughts together on this, and then we will throw it open for a question and answer time. So on behalf of the organizers, my colleague and myself, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and giving us this evening. I pray it'll be a meaningful time for all of us as we face this very critical and defining theme. We are coming to it from the Judeo-Christian worldview, and you will see that very quickly on how I have positioned it. I believe there are really four thoughts on how the Judeo-Christian worldview sees the essence and the existence of a human being, what we call homo sapiens. The first is in the reality of creation, that we are not the random collocation of time plus matter plus chance. We are not an accidental blip on the radar screen of time, that there is a designer and a creator who has a specific purpose for who we are and why we are here. Now, the problem with even that first assertion is that across the decades, so many contrary views have come, so many debates have been held, so many perspectives and counter perspectives, and oftentimes the debates are held on the processes through which we became what we are, rather than focusing on the first cause and the purpose and the essence of who we are. The truth of the matter is, you can take a diversity of Christian thinkers on this, and they will have a diversity of views on the issue of time, on the issue of process, in the issue of contingencies, and so on. On the age of the earth, all of these come in. When you get sidetracked into that, you forget the fundamental precept of what it is the intention was in God's mind, who we are and why we are here. And this is what I want to say to you, even the noted philosopher Anthony Flew, who for most of his life was an avowed atheist and wrote so much against the existence of God, in the last few years of his life turned, went onto the fork in the road because he believed his own critique of theism was not valid in his mind anymore, and he made a strong statement that the philosophical ramifications of our origin are crucial for the issue of morality and meaning. The philosophical ramifications of who we are are defining for morality and meaning. How we go through our moral reasoning and how we attribute meaning and purpose to human life. You know, it's fascinating even listening to the debate in the last one with one segment of uh, the candidates. And one of them was asked why her position had changed on a certain issue. And it is interesting that she previously defined her position with the word sacred in there. That there was a sacredness to our lives. But when the definitions changed, the word sacred was left out. And the entailments of removing sacred are enormous. You desacralize life, you desacralize relationships, you desacralize all of your work in life, and suddenly, what is the opposite of sacred? Profane. Profanum comes from the Greek where you literally lock God and the temple, as it were, outside of your life. The desacralization of life has ramifications, which G.K. Chesterton said so well. He said, the tragedy of disbelieving in God is not that a person ends up believing in nothing. Alas, it is much worse. That person may end up believing in anything. He went on to say, there's only one angle at which you can stand straight and many angles at which you can fall. And so whatever your view, we must realize we are here 
to think of the philosophical extensions and the ramifications of how we define who we are. Now, the fact that the Judeo-Christian worldview sees a creator, without getting into the particulars of the how, two necessary entailments follow or implications. Number one, there is intrinsic worth to every life. That worth is not given by government. That worth is not given by some statute. That worth is not given by a community or a society. That worth is intrinsically and essentially yours by virtue of being a person created by a designing and a worthy God. When Joseph Stalin was tormenting his people and killing them by the millions, he was not a very tall man. Stalin was not his real name. It was a nickname that was given to him of the steely countenance. It is fascinating when he began to torture his own people. I told this story to the faculty at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy, and there was spin drop silence. Here's, was, here's the story. A Western diplomat went to see Mr. Stalin and asked him how he planned to have his people continue to follow him when he was torturing them like this. Stalin never gave them this diplomat a verbal answer. He called a waiter and asked the waiter to bring him a live chicken. He took the live chicken and put that chicken under his arms and started to defeather that bird till it was completely denuded. The chicken by this point was quivering and trembling in his hands. He took the chicken and put it down, picked up a piece of bread and walked away from that chicken as the chicken was quivering there on the, on the ground. And the chicken hobbled over towards Joseph Stalin, nuzzled between his trouser legs for warmth. Stalin bent down with a piece of bread and the chicken started to peck away at that bread. And Stalin looked at his visitor and said, do you have your answer? I tortured that chicken. It will follow me for food the rest of its life. He said, people are like that. You torture them, and they will follow you for food the rest of their lives. Very few journalists and diplomats had the courage to call him for who he was. Malcolm Muggeridge did in his book, Winter in Moscow. And when he came back, he had changed his complete position on what a government like that was, which treated its people in such a demeaning way. That's precisely how he had started to define them. People were a means to his end. His ends were a clenched fist, which was the last gesture before he died, a fist towards the heavens. Young people, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at God's word, Moses gave his people 613 laws. David reduced them to 15. Isaiah reduced them to 11. Micah reduced them to three, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. So Micah took 613 laws and brought it down to three, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. When Jesus was asked by an antagonist what the greatest commandment was, it is amazing to me that he did not reduce it to one. It's profoundly moving to me that he did not reduce it to one. He could have, but he reduced it to two. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on these two hang all of the laws and all of the prophets. 613 laws were put on two pegs. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Why did he give us two and not one? Because of the first, the second necessarily follows. Without the first, the second is with its feet firmly planted in midair. You don't have the essence of what the created order is, then loving your neighbor becomes purely an option for you and for me. Jesus said it is not an option. It is a necessary corollary. It follows from the first. 
You see, your ethnicity, your race, who you are, is your distinctive gift by God. It is an inviolable gift that God has given to you. When he talks of all of the nations, when Paul gives his sermon in the book of Acts, he talks of all of the nations that were there and how God had called him to take that message to every nation and every tongue and every tribe. You are a creature created by God and there's a segue I want to give to you here before moving to the second ramification. I want you to follow me carefully now. Not only are you of essential worth with humanity, in that essentiality, there's a particular worth to you. I want you to follow this very carefully so we, <coughs> so we don't get lost in this whole thing that we call the mass of humanity. There is an individuality to you. In fact, it comes from the Latin indivisible. You cannot be broken up. You come as a unique composite. You are irreplaceable. A position can be refilled, but you will never replace a person. There's a uniqueness to them. My son, who's here in the audience, went to Taylor University, and in 2006, Taylor University had a terrible tragedy take place. On a weekend, some of the students were coming back from a weekend, I don't know where they had gone for some uh, work over the weekend or what, and they were driving back in a van, and if I remember the story, at least parts of it correctly, I think it was a truck that crossed over the medium, median and slammed into them, and most of them in that van were smashed to death, they were killed. One of the students survived. All the parents were informed. They came and picked up the corpses of their loved, their loved ones, and funerals were held. But the Van Rin family was told that their daughter, Laura, <clears throat> was still alive, albeit hanging on by a thread. So the Van Rin family hung around the bed day after day, week after week, and I think it was her boyfriend who was also present. And as she was beginning to regain consciousness, start to ask her questions, <clears throat> but none of the questions they asked her were making any sense within the context of the Van Ryn family. And I think it was a boyfriend who one day said, you know, there's something wrong here. Either she's completely out of it, or I don't think this is Laura. And the parents were upset, saying, what are you talking about? The brain is damaged, she's been hit hard, give her some time, he said, no, something is wrong. And one day this gal looking up with her matted blonde hair and all says, I don't understand why you keep calling me Laura. I am not Laura. My name is Whitney. I'm Whitney. There's silence in the room, and they contact the authorities in the university, saying, was there a Whitney in this van? I said, yeah, but she's been buried. I said, no, you better come on over here. <clears throat> so they talked to her, and they bring in the coroner and asked him if he'd done a DNA test on the burials, said no. Said, do you know who this is? And they did a DNA test and found out she was indeed Whitney Serac. She was not Laura Van Ryn. But there was already a grave marker with Whitney's name on it, although she was here, very much alive. And all of a sudden, the Seracs are contacted and told, your daughter is alive. And the Van Rins had to pack their bags and go back and go to the grave and realize that their daughter was actually buried there and the change of the name had to take place on the marker. Every life in that van was valuable. But there were relationships and a particularity. That's why we are given names, not to confer individuality, but to recognize the individuality that is already there. <coughs> I had some water here. <coughs> so in creation, we have the ramifications of intrinsic worth. We also have, number two, a reflective splendor. There is a splendor that we are called upon to reflect, and that splendor is ultimately to the glory of God. That's what sacredness really means, set apart. We are set apart for the glory of God. 
after the war, when the Japanese Prime Minister Konoye thought of all the horrors that had transpired and all that had been engineered and all of the schemes that were lost, he was alone in a room and took his own life. When they saw him, having taken his own life on his bed, they looked at the night table and Oscar Wilde's De Profundis was on the night table. And the last page that he had open, he underlined this, these words, as terrible as it was what the world did to me, nothing was as terrible as what I did to myself. Nothing was as terrible as what I did to myself. As I speak to you, there's a great tragedy taking place in Vegas. A renowned basketball player, Lamar Odom, I think is his name, about seven feet tall or something, big strapping figure, wanted to get away from it all. What did he do? He spent his time in a brothel, drugged his body with cocaine and other stuff to give him some excitement for those few days till a 911 call came and described what was coming out of his nose and what was coming out of his mouth and he was totally unconscious and I think some news wires are saying that he's gone, other news wires are saying that he's unconscious in extremely critical condition. And I, I don't know the man, I, I don't even remember watching him play, but here's what I wanna say to you. What a way to bid goodbye to the world when you're blessed with such physique and such genius in a capacity that very few human beings would ever have. He was looking for a thrill, looking for something to bring him out of his doldrums and into some sense of excitement. And he's bid goodbye to this world and he may as well underline also the words of Oscar Wilde, as terrible as it was what the world did to me, nothing was as terrible as what I did to myself. And so to you young men and women, if there's a challenge I want to give to you, there's a reflective splendor to which God calls you. Don't let anybody rob you of that when he reminds you that he has made you for himself and your heart is restless until you have your rest in him. The creation factor talks to me of intrinsic worth and a reflective splendor. And then there is a second thing. That is the incarnation. The incarnation actually reminds me that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the person of Jesus Christ, we see the, un the unfolding of the gospel story. No matter what your faith or your belief may be, it is a fact said by hundreds and hundreds of people, even by skeptics, that when you see the person in the life of Jesus Christ, virtually unparalleled. When I was writing my book, An Imaginary Conversation Between Jesus and Buddha, I entitled it The Lotus and the Cross, Jesus Talks to Buddha. I interviewed so many Buddhist monks, priests, and scholars in Thailand, in Malaysia, and all of that. And oftentimes at the end of the day, I would sit down with them and talk to them. And the conversation would move to the person of Jesus Christ and my faith. On more than a half a dozen occasions, a monk or a priest or a scholar would say, you know what? In Jesus Christ, we see somebody so unique and so unmatched. And there would be a recognition and a respect for who he not only claimed to be, but how he lived. In the person of Jesus Christ and his incarnation, I see two implications. Number one is the absoluteness of the moral law, that this is a moral universe. We have to think in terms of moral reasoning. And what we are watching happen in our political landscape in America is a destructive process right now. And why is it destructive? Because we only think of right and left, we have forgotten there's an up and a down. When you lose the up and the down, you will only have the right and the left, and you will have swords drawn against each other. Do you know in the House of Commons in London, the two parties are actually separated by a measured distance. It was so that if you spat, you couldn't spit across on the other person. 
And I think it has something to do with certain sword lengths as well. Imagine leading a country but keeping you from spitting against each other. Last year I had the privilege of being in Brazil along with some friends here to see the World Cup in soft soccer. Now I've seen cricket. It's a gentleman's game. That's why you hear somebody when someone else is cheating, you say, that's not cricket. Soccer, huh? You can bite off another person's ear, you can do whatever you want and be sent home, you know. And the hundred people who had the closest seats to the game, three feet away from the rim of the field, did not get to see the game or any match. They had to turn their backs to the play because they were watching all of the rabble rousers up in the stands in case anybody came with knife and other weapon in hand to kill the player he didn't think performed to his liking. And the players, they themselves had men in uniform watching their behavior. I was doing a program for the BBC and mentioned this. Players had referees and umpires watching to make sure nobody chewed off another person's ear. Outside the rim were standing a hundred fellows looking at us so that they made sure we didn't do anything naughty. And you know what the BBC guy said to me? I'm not sure you really want to use this illustration in England because soccer is a very sacred thing out here, you know. Fascinating. What do we see? Laws are broken again and again and again. Rules are broken again and again and again. And that's why we need thousands of pages for uh, health insurance laws because every sentence dies the death of a thousand qualifications. It's not enough to use one word on a plane about the smoke detector. They say don't touch, tamper, disable, or destroy. No. Why can't you just say, don't mess with this? <laughs> because somebody can say, I didn't mess with it, it just messed itself, you know. My father-in-law was a chemical engineer with Shell Oil. He had a brother who had a way with words. And his brother, in the younger days, they had these gramophone machines and gramophone records made out of plastic or whatever. And inadvertently, his brother Arnold sat on a chair with about 12 of his father's favorite records on, a, on the chair and crashed, the whole thing smather, smash, was smashed, it broke. And Arnold didn't know what to do, his father was really gonna have his hide when he got back. So the father came back and he walked into the living room and saw the shattered pieces of all of those favorite uh, LPs as they call them, long playings, the records. And he called the boys down and said, what happened here? And Arnold looked and said, Dad, it got sat upon. It got sat upon. So what you're really saying is, it's its fault. If it weren't there, it would not be the way it is right now. I have a friend in Australia who is attending a weekend of a social, and his wife made two beautiful cream pies. He told me this story himself. He said, and he was bringing it down the stairs, one in each hand. She'd spent all, you can see what's coming. You know. <laughs> And he stumbled and slipped, and the pies, Murphy's Law, face down. And he looked at it, and he said, called his wife. He said, why didn't you cover it? Why did you give it to me like this? And she just stood there staring at him. He said, then I burst out crying, think what a fool I am, you know. There is a moral law, and here's what I want to say to you. Somebody was asking a question, and a good question yesterday at Carnegie Mellon, and he raised the question that, yeah, religion has oppressed people, atheists have oppressed people, you know, haven't they both in power done the wrong things? Yes, but there is a difference. When a man who claims to be a Christian oppresses people and hurts them and bullies them and victimizes them, he or she is violating, is violating the rules by which the Christian is called to live, violating the message. 
But if an atheist does what Mao Zedong did, what Stalin did, they could legitimately consider it a natural outworking of their atheistic worldview. One can be logically deduced for their own purposes, one is an illogical, and that is the difference. Kai Nielsen, the atheist from Calgary, says this, we have not been able to show that reason requires us to have a moral point of view, or that really rational persons unhoodwinked by myth or ideology need not be individual egoists or classical amoralists. Reason doesn't really decide here. I know the picture I have painted for you is not a pleasant one. Reflection on this depresses me. Pure practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not take you to morality. Pure practical reason, even with a good knowledge of the facts, will not lead you to morality. There is no rationally compelling reason why you should be moral. You may choose to be, and many of them are, there's no rationally compelling reason for it because morality is ultimately self-referencing. And so I say to you, in the whole reality of incarnation, we get the absoluteness of the moral law and the second ramification is we have the supremacy of love. We have the supremacy of love. This thing for which we yearn Again, someone last night asked the question of love. And I talked of the words from the Greek, agape, phileo, storge, eros, God's love, friendship love, protective love, romantic love, all hang on the peg of God's love. My love and how I express my love cannot be self-defined. It is defined by God. And an intrinsic part of God's definition for love is commitment. Commitment is an inextricable part of love. You know, I was talking to a person a few weeks ago, came to visit me. I won't say too much. These things are live streamed and I want to protect people. And whatever the situation was, she'd wanted out. She'd wanted out from her family. And I said, to her, I said, you're counting the cost, are you? She said, yes. I said, reason? She said, I have no reason, I just want out. I said, did you ever love this individual? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I said, but now? She said, oh no. And the conversation went. And I said, how do you know that you will not get into another relationship and again claim love now? and three years from now claim it's not there. I said, you better think very carefully about what love really means. You have to have that sense of commitment. In the old English language, the commitment was made in these words, with my body, I the worship. There was an exclusivity made in love, an exclusivity so that when you said, yes, I do to one, you were really saying, no, I don't, to every other. There is a sacredness that is given to love. But you know, I want you to follow this now. Yeah, it's easier to talk about something like that, isn't it, as adults and all of that. I'm now a grandfather, and I watch the grandkids in a very different way than I watched my own. And my daughter one day said to me, Dad, why? I said, I don't know. Maybe you have a certain stock of affection and love, and when you have your own, 90% of them is exhausted in worry and care and bathing and providing this and that. You've only got about 10% left to feel. <laughs> and when you have the grandkids, the parents do the 90% of the care. Now we've got 90% of the feel and only 10% of the work. So when of our grandkids come and visit us, we have a ball, but when they go, my wife and I sit down on a chair and stare at each other for about two minutes saying, what just happened? You know? <laughs> Let me tell you about our little, Vincent Churchill was unsauced by a corporal. Have I ever told you about my grandchildren? Churchill said, no, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. <laughs> Since I'm not Churchill, let me tell you a couple of stories. <laughs> 
Our oldest grand grandson is a fellow by the name of Jude. He has a vocabulary and a half. I don't know where he picks up his vocabulary from, but I'll tell you he sure can use it. Big, big words. And about, he's now four, but when he was about three and a quarter or something like that, or three and a half, he was, everybody we were praying around the table for the food. And then he looks at his father and says, mommy prayed, why did you say amen? So, uh, he, sorry, it was the other way around. He looked at his mom and said, daddy prayed, why did you say amen? So she, being the daughter of an apologist, gave too long an answer. <laughs> she was going on and on and on, and he was just staring at her and finally threw his arms up in the air, and he went like this. Will somebody please explain to me what on earth has just happened here? <laughs> Three and a half. Not long after that, his mom had lost her car keys looking around the house. She couldn't find it. She just paused for a moment, slapped her forehead, and said, I must be losing my mind. He walked up to her and he said, Mommy, whatever you do, don't lose your heart because I'm in there. Three and a half. Three and a half. How is it possible for us in our world to hurt such little ones? When they've understood belongingness is a vital part of reality. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to say to you in the Christian worldview, you belong to God first. He pours that love into your relationships. Belongingness is the fountain from which all of your other relationships flow. This is very unique and very distinctive to the Judeo-Christian worldview. So you've got creation, you've got inf incarnation, thirdly and quickly you've got the transformation. God promises to change your heart. No other worldview does. Every other worldview asks you to change your own heart and earn the right, earn the right to enter into his presence. That's a reality. That's what we are told, to lift ourselves up by our own moral bootstraps. But the story that God gives to us is that he brings a change in your heart and in mine. I'm 69 years old today, of this year. Not today, not today, not today, not today. <laughs> Although if you want to give me a gift, it'll be fine, you know. <laughs> no, just kidding. 69 years old this year. It was at the age of 17 from a life of meaninglessness when I turned my life over to Jesus Christ. I never dreamed what he was going to do with me, in me, through me, for me. Yes, there have been valleys. Yes, there have been shadows. Yes, there have been long tunnels. But there's never been a moment but that I have known he brought my feet onto solid ground. And because of him, I have a light into the future. Because of him, I have an arm around my, my life as he carries me through. It's that transformation of my heart that ultimately as it happened in my heart and our brothers and sisters, actually my sister was the first to lead me into a knowledge of these kinds of things, that my father's heart was ultimately changed. And if you knew known my, my dad and the nasty temper with which he lived, when my dad's life was transformed, it was so dramatic that people who knew him marveled at what had happened in change. About five or six days from now, I'm going to be in Louisiana and Baton Rouge. I will be speaking at the Angola prison. I was telling some friends before the meeting here, Angola prison was the bloodiest prison in America. Over 5,000 prisoners in Angola prison, 85% of them on life without parole. The chaplain was telling me when you had come into that prison, there was blood on the walls, blood on the carpet, blood on the ceilings. When a prisoner was checked in, he was given a knife to defend himself. It's an all-male prison. 45 on death row. And as I walked past death row and shook hands with them, prayed with them, talked to them, 
and then spoke to a group of about 80 or 90 of them who have joined a seminary distance learning program. You see, some years ago, a warden by the name of Burl Kane said, I'll take over this prison, I'll direct it if you allow me to do it my way. He put a Bible in every cell. He held chapel every day. He brought a seminary into the program. And now it has become one of the safest prisons in America. And I was told by the chaplains, you could bring the prettiest young woman and walk her past these cells. You won't hear a wolf call or a whistle or a nasty comment. Profanity is not allowed in this prison by either the inmates or the staff. When you, uh, some of my buddies are gonna join me next week. I just got a confirmation from the governor's office today that we are doing this next week. And I'll tell you what, when you walk away from that chapel service and see the prison, in fact, the letter that came to me today said, would you like to have lunch with the chaplains and the team, or would you rather have lunch with the prisoners? I said, with the prisoners, don't even let me think about it. Because I've had a meal with them before when they have served it to me. You talk about faith. <laughs> serve you that. They lead in the worship service. When they're doing their Bible studies, arms and muscles bulging like watermelons out there. And one of the chaplains said to me, the gang of thugs in this prison has now become a gang of pastors. And one of them said to me when I asked him if he was there on life without parole, he said, yes. I said, how does it feel to know you're never gonna walk out of here? He said, Mr. Zacharias, if you knew what I'd done, and why I'm here. I was really a prisoner outside. He said, I have come here now and I found Jesus Christ for the first time in my life. I'm free. He said, pray for my parents. They're outside and they think they're free. They're in chains. Creation, incarnation, transformation, and lastly, consummation. God gives us a hope. God gives us a promise. God gives us the reality that time is not the end, that there is an eternity. That there is an eternity. When Jesus promised his disciples that he would rise again, he promised he would rise again bodily to give them the empirical proof of the bodily resurrection that he was, who he exactly claimed to be, and gave hope and promise to a whole generation then and to life beyond that. Billy Graham once told us, sitting around a luncheon table, that he was speaking once in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Conrad Adenauer, the Chancellor of Germany. And Adenauer broke the conversation dramatically and walked up to the window, looked out at the ruins of his city, and turned to Billy Graham and he said to him, Mr. Graham, do you believe that Jesus Christ really rose again from the dead? Graham said, I looked at him and said, Mr. Chancellor, if I did not believe that, I would have no message to give to this world. It's the resurrection of Jesus that keeps me going. I was with the Graham team people last weekend, and Billy Graham's latest book has just been released. It's called Where I Am, and it is taken from John 14. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. I go to prepare a place for you, the hope, the hope that God gives to you and to me by the resurrection from the dead. And so I close with a simple illustration and then I'll call my buddy to come and speak to you, Vince. The college football coach, Lou Little, tells a story in his memoirs about a man, a young student who was always very obedient, very good, very well behaved, but was not a first stringer, so he never played much. He was just there as a backup. But he would notice this young man showing the facilities to his father whenever his father visited, till one day, the father had passed away, and the message came to the son in the university. And so he went to the coach a little and said, do you mind if I not, I'm not there this weekend, sir? I've got to attend my father's funeral. He said, no, you can go. So he went, buried his dad, and came back. And the following weekend, he looked at the coach, and he said, do you mind if I play this game? He said, you're not number one. We have a better quarterback. He said, I understand. Let me play. 
if I'm not the best player on the field, you can sit me down. Coach Lou said he'd give him a chance or two. He was red hot, played a brilliant game, the best game he'd ever played, and was kept through the game. After it was over, he put his arm, the coach put his arm around him and he said, you know, I used to watch you walk around with your dad, showing him all of the places from a distance. I never wanted to intrude. But now that he's passed away, you did this for him, didn't you? He said, actually, coach, it's more than that. My dad was blind. And this was the first time he was ever going to watch me play. And I was playing this for him. When you have the eternal perspective, it redefines everything for you. So you've got from the created order to the incarnation, to transformation, to consummation. That's what it means to be human in the Judeo-Christian worldview. God bless you. Thank you so much. Come on up, Randy. Thank you. Well, whenever I uh, follow Ravi, I wish that I went first. It's a real privilege to be you all tonight, and Robbie and I thought I might just spend 10 minutes telling you a bit about my story before we go on to take some of your questions. And I'm always particularly thankful when I have a chance to speak about Christianity. Great. Thank you. I'm always particularly thankful when I have a chance to speak about Christianity in a university context, because uh, it was in a university context that I first became a Christian. I didn't show up in college as a Christian, and, and actually I had some really major misconceptions about the Christian faith when I first showed up. Really two major misconceptions, and I'm just going to share with you briefly about each of those. First, I really thought that Christianity was for people who were stupid. I thought that Christianity was for people who didn't think hard enough. Um, actually, the first Bible that I ever had, I was challenged to read through it by someone. And as I did, I would uh, cross things out and add things, and I'd write a big BS in the margin whenever I disagreed. Uh, and Christians would sort of look over and say, why do you have a BS in the margin of your Bible? And I'd say, oh, that verse makes for a great Bible study. <laughs> I came over time to think that I was dead wrong in my assumption that Christianity had to be anti-intellectual. I don't want you to take my word for that. I want you to go out and look into it um, yourself. That's what I did. Today, actually, back in Oxford, where I live and teach, Professor Brian Leftow is giving his first lecture of the year in his series on the existence of God. Leftow is the head professor in philosophy of religion at Oxford, and, and each week in that series, he'll make a rigorous defense of a different argument for God's existence. Now, I wish I had time to talk to you about each one of those arguments now. I don't. Feel free to bring that up in the Q&A if you want. Before Leftow held the head post at Oxford in philosophy of religion, it was held by a man named Professor Richard Swinburne. Swinburne is probably the most influential British philosopher of religion of the last 60 years um, or so. He still lives in Oxford. He's going to be coming and guest lecturing in a course I'm teaching later in the year. And one of the things that he'll talk about in that lecture is a book that he published in 2003. It's called The Resurrection of God Incarnate. And in that book, he argues that on the available evidence today, it's 97% probable that Jesus truly, miraculously rose from the dead after having died, confirming that he is the God that he claimed to be. Now, that might sound like a crazy claim to you. It certainly sounded like a crazy claim to me. 
but I just couldn't believe that there were people of this stature who were writing about these things and coming to conclusions like that and being able to defend them. We're talking about a book that's published by Oxford University Press, someone who's considered the foremost philosopher of religion in all of Britain and who can ably defend that claim at top academic conferences all around the world, and I've seen him do it. And for me, at least, that forced me to the position where I had to say it has to be possible to be fully committed to intellectual rigor and also to be a fully committed Christian. I think I was wrong that Christianity is for people who don't think hard enough. I also think I was wrong about a second misconception I had about Christianity. And this one was really about the central message of the Christian faith. To me, Christianity was just a bunch of outdated rules. It was like those 613 laws that Ravi mentioned. And for me, they were really just like some of the crazy old laws that are still on American law books, technically, but they're now irrelevant and out of date and no one would think that they had any meaning. I found a couple of those laws as I was putting this together. So apparently, in Baltimore, it's illegal to take a lion to the movies. And it's pretty disturbing to think that at some point someone felt the need to make that law. And in Oklahoma, this is my favorite one, it's illegal to have a sleeping donkey in your bathtub after 7 p.m. <laughs> Why anyone would think that would be okay before 7 p.m., no idea. But I used to think of Christianity a bit like this, a load of weird, out-of-date, impossible-to-follow rules. But when I began to look deeper during my first year of college, what I found was that the meaning of Christianity was completely different from what I thought it was. And I can remember thinking to myself, why didn't someone tell me about this sooner? If someone had told me what this was really about, I would have signed up ages ago. And what I found was that Christianity isn't primarily about rules, it's primarily about relationships. And there's one story that Jesus told which especially helped me to see this. It's a story about a son. Some of you will know it. It's a son who breaks every rule. He demands his inheritance early from his father. Then he abandons his family. Then he wastes what his father had worked his whole life to provide on wild living and meaningless life. Eventually, the son hits rock bottom. He decides to return home and to beg his father for a job. Now, the son would have known that in that ancient Jewish culture, if a son lost his inheritance and then returned to his village, what was supposed to happen was that the whole village would gather around him and shout, he has been cut off from his people. That's what was supposed to happen to this son. Instead, at the mere sight of the son, when the father sees the son still far off in the distance, the father takes off running like an embarrassing fool, and he throws his arms around his son, and he kisses him, and he welcomes him home. Now, I'm sure that the father in this story wasn't pleased about the rules that had been broken. I'm sure he took that seriously. But the father's love for his son and his desire for relationship completely overshadowed everything else. The son simply says, I was wrong, and I'm sorry. But before he can even get the words out of his mouth, the father throws his arms around him and squeezes him tight. He embraces him just as he is. And then to show the son just how committed he is to having him home again, he puts the best robe around his shoulders, he puts the family ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and then he goes and he kills his best animal and he throws a huge party for his son. So often in this life, you are going to be asked to believe that your value as a human being depends on how well you adhere to other people's rules and how well you meet their expectations, that you're only worth getting excited about if you've been impressive or successful or beautiful. Christianity says otherwise. Christianity says that the best forms of love are not about deserving, they're not about what we earn or merit 
or accomplish. They are simply about being a child. The son in this story, he broke every rule, but he was a son. He was family, and that was more than enough. And Jesus told that story as a picture of God's love for us. Love that is unconditional. Love that cannot be earned by following the rules. Love that cannot be lost by breaking the rules. And so as a Christian, you can stop competing to be loved and just enjoy it. If someone asked me to sum up my whole experience of the Christian life in one sentence, that might be it. You could stop competing to be loved, and I could just start enjoying it. Look, I hope every one of you is tremendously successful here in college and beyond. I hope you get high GPAs and scholarships and championships and promotions at work and all of that good stuff. But most of all, I hope you will know that you are unconditionally loved by God and invited into relationship with him. And I hope that that will be the most important truth about who you are as a human person. That what will define you as a human will be the only thing about you that can never change. The only thing about you that can never change. That you are unconditionally loved by God and invited into relationship with him. Thank you so much for listening and invite Ravi back up and we'll take your questions. Thank you again. At this time, we're going to start our Q&A process. Uh, and here is the, 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 the ground rules for that again. Uh, remember to be clear, concise, and relevant to the topic. And if you would like to, we are going to have the mic for microphone right here, but there are going to be two staff members over here uh, to just check to make sure that, that your questions are clear, concise, and relevant. So if you do have a question on your paper and you would like to, uh, to ask that to either Vince or Ravi, please begin making your way over here to these ladies, and they will then give you the opportunity to come to the microphone. If you're going to ask the questions via Twitter, we have a couple people checking those as well. Remember to make sure that your questions have hashtag RZIMPIT, and that way we can get to those. I'm going to ask the opening question to, uh, to Ravi and Vince, and then we are going to begin having the audience ask questions as well. Thank you again, and sorry for the, uh, the sound problems that we seem to have, but we've overcome them very much. So, Ravi, you said in your talk uh, this evening, all other worldviews outside of the Judeo-Christian worldview call us to earn our way. Why is an attempt to earn our way such a bad way to be human? <laughs> again, I apologize. resist comment. Uh, <laughs> it's a great question, and I will probably answer it in a tangential way and then get to the heart of it. I have a friend in Atlanta, Georgia. He might even be watching this program. He came from a very strong Hindu background. He was a computer systems engineer type guy. We became very good friends. And he would come every week and ask me question after question after question and be, just be going in circles the whole time. My wife, who's from Canada, would marvel at this. And she would say, he asked the same thing last Sunday, you know. I'd say, yeah. And why did he ask it again? I said, because he's Indian. We just keep going in circles. We like the circular view of life. We do it again and again and again. Then one day, he came up <clears throat> with this question for me. He said, Raviji, which is a respectful term, he said, you know, I was thinking, he said, when I borrow money from a bank, my bank manager is kind enough to tell me how much I owe and how long it is going to take for me to pay it off. I know what I owe and what time I have in which to pay it back. He said, actually, my bank manager is kinder than the karmic law. 
<clears throat> because in karma, I don't know how much I owe and I don't know how many incarnations I need to have in order to pay it off. I said, I didn't ask the question, you did. You tell me about it. And then I told him a conversation I had with the chief Buddhist monk, a uh, women's monk, the only woman Buddhist monk ordained in Thailand. I had to go to Sri Lanka to be ordained because in Thai Buddhism they didn't do that the ordination of women. She got ordained, came back. She has a PhD from McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Brilliant gal. So she and I were talking and uh, we were asking each other questions. And finally one day I said to her, is every life a rebirth? Is every birth a rebirth? She said, yes. I said, in every birth you're paying for the previous birth. She said, that's right. I said, if you start from now and go back to the beginning, it's a finite number of births you have had. From now going backwards, you've not had an infinite number of births. She said, that's right. I said, so you've had a finite number of births. She said, that's right. I said, what were you paying for in your first birth? If every birth is a rebirth, and in every birth you're paying for your previous birth, what were you paying for in your first birth? He paused and looked at me and said, we don't ask those questions. <clears throat> and I told it to my friend. And he looked at me and he said, you know, the longer I am listening to what you have to say, the more I am totally taken up by what the cross of Jesus Christ is all about. He said, I cannot earn my karmic right. I simply don't even know how much I owe every life, I, every day, I wonder how much I really owe in all of this. And so if you look at Buddha, all the pantheistic, world, pantheistic worldviews, they have to pay, they have to pay, but they never know when they have paid enough. That is unknown to them. If you were to talk to a devout Muslim, he would honestly say to you, would you say, how do you get to paradise? He'll say, your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. And you ask him, do you know if you have reached that stage? He'll say, no. And I had a friend from Iraq who was telling me that every Friday he would walk to the farthest mosque in order to count the number of steps he would take to take care of all the bad things he'd done the rest of the week to earn the right for his good deeds to outweigh his bad deeds. It's amazing the psychological aspect of legalism. All of the worldviews move in that direction. But in the Judeo-Christian worldview, you have the offer of Christ to forgive what you and I can never make up by our sure good deeds. You see, Jesus Christ didn't come into this world to make bad people good. He came into this world to make dead people live. Sin is not just a transgression. Sin is also a missing of the mark. You miss the mark. So our very lives, no matter how good we are, misses the mark of meeting the glory of God. Salvation is a gift in the Christian worldview. And then with gratitude, you live out your life in demonstration of that appreciation. This is very unique, very unique, unmatched in any other worldview offered. Just quickly add a sort of personal experience to this because I think sometimes what's behind the question is a temptation to think actually we don't owe that much, so, so maybe I can work it off because I, I'm, you know, I'm not that far in debt. I live a pretty good life. And I just had an experience a few years ago where uh, a guy who I didn't treat well when I was younger, when we were teenagers, he wasn't a very nice kid, neither was I. Uh, I can remember putting him down and taking every opportunity I could to do so. And uh, I found out a few years ago that he had taken his life, that he had committed suicide. And it, it made me ask the question, you know, would that have been the case had I been kind to him, had I offered my hand to him rather than pushing him down? And I, I don't know the answer to that question. Some of you would know that the Bible says the wages of sin is death. I had read that line many, many times. I don't think I had ever really felt the full force of it. We see so little of the rippling effects of our bad deeds, of our sins. God sees things from a perspective that's very different. And I wouldn't want to see what all the rippling effects of my unkind words have been over the years, not just in that one person's life, but in so many other lives as well. Perhaps some of us have also had the experience of, of maybe making some moral progress in our lives, something that perhaps we used to think was fine, no big deal, 
But now that we've moved past that, we're able to look back on it and say, actually, that was pretty terrible what I used to do. I'm glad that's not something that I do anymore. Well, imagine if you were God. Imagine how far along that process he must be, a being who's perfectly holy. What must our sin look like to him? If even we can look back and say, actually, that thing that I thought was no big deal, actually, that was pretty bad. From the perspective of a perfectly holy God, what must that look like? So I think both because we don't see the rippling effects of our actions and because our perspective is so finite, it's not the perspective of a holy God, I think we really do underestimate just how much it is that we owe, which makes the Christian story that much more remarkable that God would come and pay that price for us. I think part of what it means to be human is to be in need of forgiveness. Um, hope this is working. Maybe not. Uh, I don't know. That'd be a novel idea. Hello? Okay, good. Uh, thanks for being here, guys. It's uh, been great. So this is a question about uh, physician-assisted suicide. Um, so this is for both of you, I suppose. I said, uh, so while we still lack the ability to choose our birth and therefore accept our natality in the face of desire and autonomy, fatality seems to be within our reach. So I was wondering if you could discuss the issue of physician-assisted suicide pursuant to your views on autonomy and theonomy, and if you think that the unknown fatality is necessary to be human. The last line again, Sorry. Sorry. Um, do you think that um, unknown fatality is something that is necessary to be human? I think I'm getting the last word, un unearned. Let me, let me get to the heart of the question then, that is physician-assisted suicide. The basic question you're having is, is it right to be proceeding with that and for a person to request that of a physician? Is that really the heart of what you're saying? Sure. You know, my, my brother is a physician and a surgeon at that too, and he's uh, actually chief of pain management in McMaster in Ontario, Canada. He faced a lot of these issues of people struggling with pain. And uh, pain is a very terrible thing with which to live. I remember when I injured my back, and that's why it's actually easier for me to stand even answering your question. I have two titanium rods from L3 to S1 with four clamps and eight screws bolting me down. I'm bound from mid-back right into my sacrum tailbone after I injured my back. And I remember there were days I would sit in my car <clears throat> and put my head on the steering wheel and cry. Say, am I ever going to get rid of this pain? Because I never dealt with, I never wanted to take any prescription medication. I just felt I didn't want to go that route. Uh, I've heard physicians say a short-term solution could be a long-term problem. So you take physical pain, it's an awful thing. You take emotional pain, it's a terrible thing. You take the breakdown of hope, all of these things come into being. All I know is, if I were a physician, I would not want to play God with a patient's life, no more than I would want to play God with my own life and choose to take it. There are long answers to this, there are short answers to this, there are schools of ethics and bioethics, my own alma mater, Trinity International University in Deerfield, Illinois has a huge department in this right now. I would just say, as a general rule, you always operate first by the rule and then you take where the contingencies come in. That's the issue that I think we always live with in life. And as a rule, I would say that when you look at people who have lived with a lot of pain and endured a lot of pain and whose faith has remained unshaken, then I would say to you, I would always trust God to be able to cushion and cradle me through any disappointment or any pain. What kind of pain can I think of that would want to decimate this temple of the living God rather than trusting him to take care of me. One of the great struggles was in the life of a woman called Annie Johnston Flint. Annie was born Annie Johnston and then was orphaned and she was adopted by the Flint family. She grew up with many, many maladies, of course orphaned first 
and then she contracted rheumatoid arthritis. She spent most of her life twisted up like a pretzel in pain. In fact, what my eyewitness said, the last time he saw her, she had eight cushions around her body, cushioning the sores because she'd been at bed that long. The biography, I think, is called The Making of the Beautiful by Roland Bingham. She got cancerous. She got blind. She was incontinent. So here she was, orphaned, rheumatoid arthritis, incontinent, cancerous, blind. She wrote a book of hymns and songs in those conditions. One of them is this, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundaries known unto men, for out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Beautiful hymn. So he sustains and he gives. And so... Let me, just, let me just close with this. I'm not minimizing the agony of it. I know I've been there at trying at 17 to end it all. And so I just say this to you. When the state, when statecraft becomes soulcraft and we start defining things like it's okay for you to make that judgment call, remember what I said about language, how it'll die the death of a thousand qualifications. You make this possible in contingency A and B, it'll happen in C, D, E, F, and it'll become a kind of a slippery slope in which man will suddenly end up playing God and euphemistically we may call it whatever we will, but what we are really doing is not offering hope and sustenance, we are telling people we are here to end your life. And if this body is the temple of the living God, I don't wish to profane it, nor do I wish to legitimize the profanation of it. I think there are other solutions and other ways that God will give us to strengthen the person who's struggling with hope. You give a person hope, and you give them love, and you give them sustenance, they will endure it and walk through the dark tunnel and the dark night of the soul. That would be my answer to you. Yeah. Thank you. Not really going to add to that, but just to say, as as you were, as I add to it, uh, just to, just to say that the verse that came to mind as as Ravi was was talking was, "My heart is sorrowful even to death." Um, Jesus speaking in the garden the day before uh, he knew that he was going to go to his death, and so you know both emotionally the day before and in physical pain the next day, Jesus knew what it was to be so far along that spectrum of pain and suffering for there even to be that sense of even to death. And one of the greatest cruelties of suffering is its isolation. And so when Ravi says we can always give hope, one of the reasons we can always give hope is because the Christian faith is the only one that has a God who always understands what it is to be in that place where my heart is sorrowful even to death. And that's something we can always offer. Can I add one more footnote to that? Yeah. Do you... You know the name of Kevorkian in relation to that. I don't know where you're seated, somewhere here. I like to look eyeball to eyeball. You're somewhere around there. There you are, sir. Some years ago, I saw Kevorkian on a television program, and he was with, on CNN with Dr. Gupta, who was their uh, medical advisor. It was a fascinating conversation, but it all boiled down to how Kevorkian interpreted life. He started off with his definition of being human to Dr. Gupta, and if you can, I'm sure you can get it in their uh, archives, they can hear it. And he basically said, you know, you're just a bunch of chemical uh, blobs here put together. There's no purpose to your life. He kept repeating that. There, what is your life's purpose? There is no purpose. So why live like that? So the foundation on which he moved to his, of course he himself I think has passed away now, but. That, I'm sure it's in their archives, and that's something Dr. Gupta never seemed to latch on to and ask him, that's what you really think life is all about. It starts off with what it means to be human and ends up ultimately with the loss of the value of life too. So just get that and you'll see the logical connection on the two. Good evening. 
Um, so I'm a Hindu. Uh, my question for you is that through my you know, cursory review of most religions, it seems like they all have a common thread of answering the question which seems to plague us all, which is what happens to us when we die. It's the one question I think that a lot of us have difficulty with because we cannot answer it. And so it seems like this common thread is it gives us hope for the afterlife, something better than what we have right now. And it feels like, I feel like a lot of religions, that what they do is they put forth codes or rules of conduct to help us live a good life so that we can achieve this afterlife. And so given this commonality, what makes you believe that Christianity is the correct or right religion? <laughs> Great question. Great question. And your name is? Suketu. Spell that for me. S-U-K-E-T-U. Suketu. I think you've asked a very, very important question. First of all, uh, let me qualify it a little bit, and I'm sure you already know that, that not all religions talk about an afterlife, uh, mainly the monotheistic ones do. The pantheistic ones are reincarnation, even the reincarnation between Buddhism and Hinduism is a little different. In Hinduism, it's the transference of identity one into another in a different form, but in uh, Buddhism, it's not even sure whether it's the identity that's transmigrated or just another form of essence that has emerged. A worldview is built not on one line of argument. A worldview is built on a connected series of arguments. And if a worldview were just built on one line of argument, I think this is the mistake naturalism often makes. It'll take sort of one argument that it has in its favor and forget all the myriad other questions that emerge. When I look at the person and the work of Jesus Christ, this is the most important question I had to ask. Now, granted, I asked it in reverse fashion because I was on a bed of suicide. A Bible was brought to me, and I prayed a prayer of desperation. I grant you that. I just had no hope. But I was read the verse, Jesus said, because I live, you also shall live. I just said, this is talking about a life that I don't have, and maybe this is the life I need. And so I prayed that prayer, but then I made a prayer a commitment right on that bed. I was 17, and I said, Jesus, if you're who you claim to be, I will leave no stone unturned in my pursuit of truth. Because my goal was truth. Pragmatically, it made sense for me to hang on to a life jacket that was thrown my way. But then I began my years and years and years of study. When you look at the life of Christ from the prophetic schema of hundreds of years before, where he was going to be born, what he was going to do, what his name was going to be called, how the manner of birth was, the manner of life he was going to lead, how he was going to die, and then the resurrection from the dead. The uniqueness about the New Testament and Old Testament scriptures, it's not a single author. It's multiple authors. As you know, 66 books, 40 different authors have edited it. And it is interesting that Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, who wrote one-third of it, came in a reverse fashion to the rest of them. The disciples came birth, life, death, resurrection, and that's how they found new Jesus. Not so with Saul, who came to be, who became Paul. He said, when he was encountered the risen Christ, he said that I may know him, the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. He started with the resurrection, but he said he needed to understand the cross because he came in reverse chronological order, but he encountered the risen Christ the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and Thomas especially, these two dramatic conversions are powerful witnesses of what happened. Saul who was killing them, he was standing, standing there watching Stephen being martyred and kept the clothes of those who were stoning him. Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe until I see the resurrected Christ myself. And he went to India where there are 330 million deities. And he went and preached the gospel of Jesus and paid with his own life. That kind of dramatic transformation took place not because of just one event, but a connected series of events. So here's the bottom line. A worldview is built around four questions. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And there are three tests for truth. Logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and experiential relevance. Logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and experiential relevance. Three tests for four questions. And when you take the, pro the prophecy of Christ hundreds of years before, from his virgin birth, you take the purity of his life unmatched, totally unmatched till this very day. 
Then the death that he promised for the forgiveness of sins, and then the resurrection. As an Easterner, I asked myself this question. When Jesus was asked how he was going to demonstrate it, if he were a fake, he would have said, I'm going to spiritually rise again. And they would never be able to falsify it. But he said, I'm bodily going to rise again. That is an empirically falsifiable dictum. All they would have had to show him was the body and say, where is he? You said he was going to rise again. So it's in the whole schema of the prophetic corpus, the hundreds of years, the multiple authors pointing towards the same, same person from his virgin birth to the purity of his life to the death on the cross for forgiveness when he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they are doing. And then the resurrection again. My four questions are answered correspondingly with truth on specific questions and coherently when all of the questions are put together and answers are given. So to me, first of all, all religions are not the same. They are actually, they may, they, people say they're fundamentally the same, superficially different. Actually, they're fundamentally different and at best superficially similar. And the fundamental difference that you see in Jesus Christ is in his uniqueness and exclusivity of his claim and the embrace that he gives to all humanity, the perfection of his life, the purity of his life, the death and the resurrection. To me, that coherence of his answers convinces me that he is who he claimed to be. And truth, by definition, is exclusive. All truth claims to be exclusive. Buddhism claims to be exclusive. Hinduism claims to be exclusive. They all have exclusivity built into that. But in the person of Christ, you see the demonstration in his birth, life, death, and resurrection. So I say to me, I am convinced that because it coheres and because I have personally verified it in my own life, and you can do that too, and find that experience, and that he is who he claimed to be. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask the next one from Twitter. Just um, to add something that Ravi's already mentioned, but the, uh, the resurrection was particularly key for me in my investigation uh, of this. I was studying philosophy. It was very important to me not to have to take some blind leap of faith and the fact that there was a publicly verifiable historical claim that I could look into was very, very important. And if you asked scholars a hundred years ago, how did we come up with a, a Christian myth of the resurrection? They would have said, well, one person told the truth to this person, that person told this person, that person told this person, and a few generations down the line, we had a crazy myth of the resurrection. Since then, in the last couple of decades, scholarship has really turned around on this question, in part because there are a few places in the Bible, in particular a passage at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, maybe you can have a look at it later, but it's a, it's a very early creed, and it lists all of the people and the groups that Jesus appeared to. He appeared to individuals and to groups at different times, in different places, doing many different things. And today, even the most atheistic critical scholars date that passage, that early creed, to almost immediately after Jesus' actual death and supposed resurrection. So the legendary development hypothesis has been thrown out of the window. What people know now is that there actually were a lot of people. The passage says hundreds of people, and then it says most of whom are still living, almost as if to say, go out and ask them yourself. There were many people who were utterly convinced they had seen this man, Jesus, alive and interacting with him after he had died. And so that then raises the question, what can account for that? What can account for this huge historical gap between what should have been the movement-ending death of Jesus and then the explosion of Christianity? Jews worshiping a man as God, unthinkable. The Sabbath changed from Saturday to Sunday unthinkable. What bridges the gap which is there no matter what you believe? That's the question for anyone. Christians bridge that gap with the resurrection. When I was looking into this as a university student, I asked the top two skeptical New Testament scholars at Princeton to meet up for a coffee to talk about this because I said, this is what I've just laid out for you. This is what I'm seeing. Here's the big gap. And I thought, okay, Christians fill that gap with the resurrection, but surely those who aren't Christians must have equally plausible alternatives. And I said to them, how do you fill that gap? 
and one of them glanced towards a mass hallucination hypothesis, which isn't taken seriously in the literature. She wasn't glancing towards it with any conviction either. There's simply too much data, too many appearances, too many people. Hallucinations are things that happen to individuals, not to groups. The other one who was a historian simply said, I'm not interested in that question as a historian. There was some sort of assumption that because it was a miraculous claim, it was therefore not within the remit of proper history, and I've never understood why. So for me, the resurrection, the fact that, the fact that you could have arguments that you can consider for that, was, that blew my mind. I just assumed that's an ancient claim that we could just never know whether that happened or not. But actually, you can look into it and you can look at the facts and then you can ask the question, what best explains the facts? And the reality is that today in the scholarship, the only explanation which is given any degree of credibility is the fact that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Every other explanation has been completely undermined. And so I think it is a rational decision to say that actually happened and then to take that next personal step of praying a prayer like the one that I prayed, which was, God, the Christian God, I don't know if I'm talking to anyone, but if I am, I'd really like to know about it. And I think that's a really powerful prayer and that God responds to that. Thank you. Sir, before you go, if you, go, if you don't mind, one of my colleagues is here. Give her your email if you don't mind about it. I've written a book called Jesus Among Other Gods. I'd be happy to send it to you with my compliments when it'll come your way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Um, I've struggled for decades on whether or not I believe that God is good. And for the past five years, I have particularly struggled with these questions. Why did God allow Satan into the Garden of Eden? Why did God banish Satan to the earth and allow him to pour his hatred and evil out on people, corrupting us further? If God is love, if he is love himself, how did he allow that? Why would he, you know, have all of these, uh, why did he create us in the first place, really? You know, if he knew all this was going to happen and all the pain and suffering, and we each have our own pain and suffering, but God knowing all the pain and suffering, why did he allow this to transpire? That is such a um, good and reasonable question. Thank you um, for it. I, um, I wrote my PhD on, on the question of why a loving God would allow evil and suffering in the world, because I think it's a, a really difficult question, and I've spent years thinking about it, and I still don't have uh, an easy answer for you. Um, you've asked a couple of different um, questions. One is about you know, why would God allow there to be a being like Satan who could potentially have negative impact on us? I do think that God is a God who loves many different types of beings. The Bible seems to imply to us that um, angelic beings like Satan was, were not initially bad, that Satan was initially um, an angel that was in fellowship with God and made a free decision to turn away from God and to use the powers that God had given him uh, in ways that God never intended. Um, as a Christian, I do think that God's created different types of beings, and just like an angelic being like Satan can have an impact on me, I can also have an impact on lower beings like chickens and fish and other parts of our natural environment that I need to steward well. God has created a system where we can have a real impact on each other and on different types of beings, both for good and for bad. Uh, and if God is going to give us the power to be good to one another, part of what comes with that, if he makes us genuinely free, is the power to be bad to one another as well. If God wanted to give me the power to help that kid Ewan, who I spoke about earlier, who I didn't help up and who I wasn't kind to, if he wanted to give me the power to be good to him, what came with that was also the power to push him down. It's the very same power that I can use in one way 
or another way. And I think God has created a world which is free and meaningful, but that also means that there's a lot of devastation in it. God is pictured as weeping in both the Old Testament and the New Testament because of that. And I think part of the difficulty for us is that we see such a small slice of our overall existence. If the Christian faith is true, and we're going to live for eternity, then what we see right now is literally just the first few moments of human existence. It would be as if aliens had tapped into a feed from Earth, and all they could see was the CCTV was a camera in the delivery room when I was being born. And all they saw was the first few moments of my life. They saw my mom be wheeled in, screaming with pain. I was in an emergency cesarean section, so they saw these doctors cutting her open with a knife. Then they saw me get taken out, blood everywhere, my mom screaming for me, and these doctors take me out of the room. If that's all that the aliens had seen, they would think that the doctors were utterly evil. In reality, the doctors saved both my life and my mother's life on that day. But it's very hard to judge sometimes someone's goodness when all you see is a thin slice of the history in which they've interacted. That's why, for me, I think the really significant thing about Christianity is that there's a distinction between goodness being explained and goodness being displayed. One of the ways you can be confident in someone's goodness even when you see suffering in the world, is if you can explain it perfectly. If you can say, here's all the reasons that the person had for allowing all of these terrible things to happen. That's very difficult to do. We can give some general reasons, but to say that about specific cases, we're not in position to do that. But there's also a case of goodness displayed. When my dad was rushed to the hospital a number of years ago, the doctor came out and said, we need to take him immediately into surgery. We don't have time to explain everything now, but there's a good chance that he'll have to receive an amputation. And at the time, it was very reasonable for me and my family to want to question that doctor, to say, is that really the best prognosis? Is he just trying to get this over with now rather than trying to battle for my dad's leg and his health operation after operation? We questioned him. But what if that doctor had come to us and said, dad's going to need significant blood transfusions during the operation, and we're having trouble finding a donor, but I'm a match. And so I'm going to volunteer to give my own blood for your dad so that he can make it through the operation and be healthy. If the doctor had done that, then I would be right to say he is good because he had displayed his goodness with such an extravagant act of love. And that would be true, even though I still couldn't tell you all of the reasons that he had for why he had to take my dad into the operation. I couldn't explain his goodness, but it had been displayed in such a way that I could be confident that he was good, even though I didn't have a perfect explanation. And I'm always struck by a line by Friedrich Nietzsche, atheist, philosopher, But he said, the gods justified human life by living it themselves, the only satisfactory response to the problem of suffering ever invented. Nietzsche was talking about the ancient Greeks when he wrote that, and in his bias, he never made the connection to Christianity. But I think as a Christian, I can affirm that statement and say it's because I have a God who came down when he didn't have to and lived a human life, including terrible suffering and ultimately his death, so that I could be healthy and live for all eternity, that I can be confident that he has displayed his goodness even when my understanding is not full. I hope that's some help. The question you've raised, I'm sure you're aware, is probably the hardest question for theism to face. And it's probably it's the old question, you know, virtue in distress and vice and triumph has made atheists of mankind. So at the heart of your question is beyond the Satan presence and all of that is the reality of pervasive suffering, profound suffering, endemic, systemic, and all of that. I want to take you through four steps and also if you'll be kind enough to leave your email with my colleague there, 
uh, Vince and I co-authored the book, uh, it was called Why Suffering. I'd like to, if you have that, we'll send it on to you. Four things I want to say to you. Number one, always think of a question and its assumptions. Very important. Always think about it. C.S. Lewis reminded us there's nothing so self-defeating as a, as a question that has been asked without thinking it through. And so in naturalism, when that question is asked, now I'm not saying you're not thinking it through, you are thinking it through, but when naturalism raises it as an evidence against the existence of God, when they say there's such a thing as evil, they have to assume there's such a thing as good. When they assume there's such a thing as good, they must assume there's such a thing as a moral law on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil. So if there's evil, there's good. If there's good, there's a moral law. If there's a moral law, they must posit a moral law giver. But that's whom they're trying to disprove and not prove. Because if there's no moral law giver, there's really no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. The question actually self-destructs. The assumption it makes is very profoundly antithetical to the worldview. So naturalism can't legitimately say this is evil. It may say it's uncomfortable, it may say I don't like it, but you invoke the category of evil, you have to climb up the ladder till you arrive. Now somebody might say, why do I need a moral lawgiver? For a simple reason, that every time we raise the problem of evil and suffering, it's either raised by a person or about a person, which means we assume the person has intrinsic worth. Naturalism cannot make that assumption because we are totally the random product of collocations of atoms and so on. So the question actually points to a God rather than saying, therefore, there is a, a, an, a, an argument against the existence of God. It actually has to bring him into the paradigm. That's the first thing. The second thing I say to you is that the possibility of worlds goes like this. God could have created nothing. God could have created a world where we would only choose good. God would have, could have created a world where there was no such thing as good or evil. Or lastly, God could have created this kind of a world where there was a possibility of good and evil. This is the only world in which love is possible. Love is not possible in the other three. It's the only, and so if love is the supreme ethic. This is the only best of all possible worlds in which love is possible. The third thing I want to say to you is that the naturalist raises the question as a trilemma. God is good, God is all-powerful, yet there is evil. These three poles of an argument. God is all-powerful, God is good, yet there's evil. It is incoherent. Why is it a trilemma? Why is it not a quadrilemma? Why not a quintilemma? God is also all-knowing. God also has eternity in perspective. So why do we only take three in order to raise the question? There are other components. And so while it's so real, I just say this to you in, in closing. Trying to get around this creates a huge dilemma in the heart. And so you go back to the question and say, is my question legitimate? I don't think it is legitimate in naturalism. I can't defend it. Love is not possible in any other religious worldview. It's only in the Judeo-Christian worldview. So let me give you a little application here, and I hope the book will take you even further. I want to thank you for your courage and the clarity with which you've raised it. I live in Atlanta, and in Georgia, there's a young gal by the name of Ashlyn Blocker. She suffers from a malady called SEPA, congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. Even the sweat glands in her body really do not work, but she's insensitive to pain. There are a handful of people in this world who've been born with that malady. They don't feel pain. And the mother was on television saying, you know, people may think it's a wonderful life, but we have to watch her all the time. If she steps on a nail while she's in sports, it could just lacerate that skin, she could bleed, she could get an infection. And so she has to be examined after every sporting game. She could put her hand on a burning stove and not know it's being burned. And so she was being interviewed and she was crying about this problem that the doctors were not able to solve, why she doesn't feel any pain. They have not solved that mystery. She ended the program by saying, every night I pray a prayer, God, please let my daughter be able to feel pain. And I just say to you is in our finite world, if pain is a possible indicator for things that are wrong, is it really impossible in an infinite world for God not to be able to explain that to your heart and mind on why it is there and why this disjunction Love is the supreme ethic. 
Pain is the greatest reminder of all that is wrong. And that's why he went to the cross, endured the pain to show us his love, and through the res resurrection gives us the hope that with his life we can find that hope and meaning. And God bless you as you think about that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> This uh, next question is going to be our last question of the evening just because we're running out of time. Uh, so, thank you. Hi. Hello, thank you, very much for, hey, thank you very much for being here tonight. And what I would like to ask is um, uh, a three-part question that are all interrelated. Uh, one, what is itself the image of God? What does it mean for us to be made in the image of God? And third, why do we find that so repulsive? And the reason I say that is because we as humans will take any excuse we can to worship anything and everything in this world, with two exceptions. We absolutely hate other people in, in and of our flesh. We hate other people and we hate God in and of our flesh without his prompting. So what is it about the image of God and being made in that that we find repulsive? Okay, can I ask you a simple question? Are you? Uh follower of Jesus yourself? Yes, I you am. You are, fair enough. Then I can give you a shorter answer. Uh, <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> I consider myself yeah. Protestant and no, uh, Calvinist. That's fine, that's house. fine. Yeah. I expect to see both Wesley and Calvin in heaven. <laughs> all right, uh, all right. <clears throat> I think it's, you framed it very well, though. I find that fascinating. I think Lewis actually addresses that in one of his books. He says, we are not so much repulsed by evil as often as we are repulsed by good because of its claims upon us. And we often are haters more of the good than we are just of the evil. Only Lewis could come up with such an angle into a reality. But let me answer your question briefly. And uh, have you uh, read the book uh, by Anthony Flew, There Is No God, No Crossed Out, There Is God and His Own Trans uh, Journey sorry, Into Theism? or at least to deism before he passed away. He has a section on this. He talks a little bit about what the image of God uh, really means. Acts correction, I'm not thinking of that book. That's, a, that's another one on the compatibility. There's a book written by Kitwood, K-I-T-W-O-O-D. It's an old one. He was a Cambridge scholar at one time. And it is called What is Human? And he takes the existentialist view and he takes the uh, naturalist view or, or, or religious view of forget what one is, the one is the Christian view. And he has a brilliant section on the image of God. So the last name is Kitwood and the book is What is Human. Basically, theologically, there have been two aspects to what the image of God is all about. One is the moral reasoning, the moral framework, okay? And the second is self-determination that we have responsibility to make our own choices. Those are the two aspects, theologically speaking, of what the Imago Dei is all about. I have moral reasoning and I have uh, the self-determination. You know, uh, I saw, uh, I, was, I was on a uh, lion safari once, or a safari in South Africa, and we were about 30 feet away from a family of lions that was feasting upon a felled, felled elephant. And they were chomping away and licking their chops, you know, enjoying all of this. It was too close to comfort. They're the beasts of the field. They're the beasts of the field. That's how they live. They destroy each other. They pummel each other. They bruise each other. We don't take them to a court of law saying, why did you hurt this elephant? You know, you ought not to have been doing this. That's the way the wild beasts are. But funny thing is, even if we had hurt that lion or that elephant, we could end up in a court of law because we are responsible, we are moral beings. We have to show the rightness of what ought to be done and what ought not to be done. Moral reasoning. This is where I think America is today. We are struggling with how to find a, an ontic referent. How do we hang our peg on an absolute moral law? We don't like it. And the moment we make a moral pronouncement, somebody stands up with anger and says, what gives you the right? And the moment they say what gives you the right, they are implying there's a moral responsibility to even having the right. <laughs> you see, it's not just a question of chemistry and physics. I could just say, well, my neurons 
when kicked into action, and that's why I'm doing this. No, they're asking me to bear responsibility. Moral reasoning is a distinctive aspect of being human. And then self-determination. You have the freedom to choose and the freedom, freedom to reject. It's the choices that we make. God has given us this powerful possibility right from the garden. The old story, and I'll close with this. You see, they were given all the privileges of everything except one. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. People may laugh at that, but they don't realize they live it out every day. The Garden of Eden story is lived out every day. What was the point? Satan said, you know, he lied to you. Why don't you do it? Because you'll become God. God said, no, don't do it. And the day you do it, you're going to die. Who turned out to be right? See, God told us we were going to destroy ourselves. What was the test? Don't play God. Don't become the definer of good and evil. Let God be the definer of good and evil. That was really what the test was all about. And now as we have chosen to define good and evil, turn on the evening news at night and you see what we've done to this earth. But the moment we come up with a prescription of moral responsibility, somebody wants to punch you in the face for that because I have no right, which in itself is a moral assumption. We talk of human rights. What are those? We first got to define what it means to be human. So why do people object to this? Because the moment you bring God in, you bring in accountability and moral responsibility. And so as I close, I just say, we thank you all for coming here tonight. You've given us such a significant amount of your time. Vince and I are honored that you are here. The most important thing I would say to you is, you have a choice. You have a choice. God makes his claim upon your life and promises to give you meaning, purpose, and the fulfillment for which he's made you. If you're a skeptic, just take the Gospel of John and start reading it and ask God to speak to you. He's real. To reveal to himself to you through that word. And I'll tell you what, the day that light dawns in your, high, in your own heart where you realize he is who you claim to be, the way, the truth, and the life, and that he came to give you an abundant life, you yourself will see this world through different eyes. Heaven above is softer blue, wrote the hymn writer. Earth around is softer green. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs o'erflow. Stars with deeper beauty shine. Since I know as now I know, I am his and he is mine. He's made you for himself. His love for you is because of his value that he places on you. He will use you in ways that will amaze and surprise you. What it means to be human is in general terms what it means to be a human being submitted to God can be in particular terms, and that you can experience in your own life. Thank you again, everyone, for giving us the honor to come back. Thank you.